We are back. Today on the podcast, I am in Virginia at the Pedro Sauer Academy, and we have special guest David Porter. I'll see you in a minute. All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast. My name is Bill Jones, head instructor of Top Level Martial Arts in beautiful downtown Cuyahoga Falls. Today I'm coming at you from 360 Herndon Parkway, One Spirit Martial Arts in Herndon, Virginia, better known as the headquarters of the Pedro Sauer Jiu-Jitsu Association. Guys, this is my mecca. I am so, uh, like, I love being here. It's one of my favorite places to be. With me, unfortunately, Slightly above novice, Mr. Edward Whitney is not with me, so I have a, a, a stunt double, prolific uh, jiu-jitsu competitor, MMA fighter, Muay Thai fighter, and overall Marvel fan, Mr. David Porter. How you doing, David? I'm great, Bill. Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> this is excellent. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. I, I don't think I've ever had such a well-received uh, intro. Yeah. I mean, oh, man, yeah. holy cow. I, I did do those things at some point. Yeah, that is me. Yeah. And I, I think more on the Marvel thing than anything. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's easier to be a geek than a, a fighter and competitor. You know, <laughs> I think I spent more time with my nose in a comic than I did, uh, you know, hitting a bag. But work, work, the work is different. Yeah, it's, it's definitely different. But... Uh, you know, it's funny because we were talking, I think yesterday we were at the diner and where, where, where didn't we somehow get into like some obscure Marvel people yesterday? Yeah. And you know, I, I get that there's a disconnect between the guys that are hardcore comic fans, Marvel Cinematic Universe only people. But, you know, you talk to somebody and they're like, man, I just caught Deadpool. And I was like, oh, really? You saw Deadpool too? He's like, no, the first one. And we're like, man, that was that years like, ago. Four years ago, dude. <laughs> man. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because we as he doing... busts out his flip phone, and you're like, "Oh, come on, dude." Yeah, it's like he's like, "How do you record the podcast?" I'm like, "On my phone." For anybody who didn't know that, now you do. I don't. Yeah. There's no fancy equipment involved for me. Well, you know, 20 years ago, this this technology didn't exist, so we're 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 right where we need to be. Yeah, I agree. Does it work? Yeah, it does. Oh, cool! It's just like my jiu-jitsu listen. then. People awesome. listen. Yeah, there you go. It's like, did they tap? Yeah. Oh, okay. Then it, then it must have been effective. Yeah. Uh, is that a bicep slicer or a shoulder lock? Yeah, sure. Did you win? <laughs> yeah, we're good. Oh, man. So, uh, super awesome weekend coming up. You, you know, we're, we're here for the, the World Conference at Pedro Sauer Academy. Um, you know, for anybody who's never been down here, if you're in jiu-jitsu and you've never taken the trip to, to meet Pedro Sauer at the Academy and train at the Academy, it is an amazing experience. Like, like. And it's weird because to, to a lot of the people here, it's just where they train martial arts. Like, they don't even think about it. They're spoiled. Some people legitimately fell on it because it happened to be close to where they lived, and they did not know what jujitsu was beforehand, and they lucked out and won the lottery and just happened yeah. to be here. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, but, like, then, then they, they – I hope they realize when they see people, like, flying in from far-flung locations <laughs> and, and going, oh, wait, this must be something special because, like, that guy is from – uh, Trinidad, Trinidad, and to, what is it? Trinidad and Tabang, Tabango, T Tobago, Trinidad, Tobago. And Tobago, and then you have guys um, that'll be here from Australia, was, yeah. um, from Europe, for, for whether it be like uh, I don't think anybody from Iceland's on this trip because they do also have uh, Johan mm -hmm. uh, has his academy, Gracie Iceland, and they have an event where they're having Master Sauer and Alan Manganello and myself out there. Um, first week of June. So I think they're just kind of saving themselves for having us you go in. out there. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm going there because Pedro's going there. Let's be real. <laughs> Master Sauer is the guy I follow. I'm like his biggest groupie. But yeah, we're, we're going to have people from all over at this World's Conference. It was Wednesday night class where you started to see, you know, 70 plus people on the mat. And you're like, oh, well, that's a tad more than normal. <laughs> and the conference doesn't technically even start till 6 p.m. tonight for the actual jiu-jitsu uh, instruction portion. But we've had two classes already. You and I had attended yesterday and the day before, mm -hmm. like seven hours each day of instructor certification training. But then just other people coming in that weren't a part of that 
just to be in here for the culture and the feel of it and training and yeah i mean i came in tuesday and my, my first thought was let's get on the mat you know I, I came in you were a little under the weather that day but um you, you know I, I did the the no gi takedown class and then that followed up uh Kristen DeBrucker, um, who is also a black belt under Master Sauer. Um, also, she, she's fought too. She, she's MMA she's, a, she's a legitimately time. tough human being in, in her own right. Um, uh, she she was here. She taught the uh, open ranks class. Um, so that was that was great. You know, it's just a great experience. And I guess my point of bringing it up at all is if if you're look if you're in the area, if you're in Virginia at all, and I know it's a big state, but you know you should really try to make it out. To, to the Pedro Sauer Academy. That, that's my opinion. I try to let as many people know that will listen. When I was coming up in jiu-jitsu, I had trained in New York. I trained in North Carolina when I was stationed there in the Marine Corps. And when I was getting out of the service, I made the choice that I wanted to go really into the deep end of jiu-jitsu and commit myself to it. And, you know, if, it, if need be, go on unemployment and only eat ramen noodle, like, I was ready. Okay. And where did I want to go? So after doing much, much research and a lot of, um, uh, you know, introspection of, the, of myself, my own game, and just look at, look at everything and say, man, who am I losing to in tournaments? Who are the guys that are just people I want to emulate? And who do I want to be at the helm, the leader? Who's the guy that I want to follow and be like? And I just kept coming to the same answer time and time again. And it was like, well, I need to get with these Pedro Sauer guys. They're doing something different. It's it's a very smooth, beautiful technique. The guy himself is just, you know, a statesman of the art, very likable. Um, he'll tell you himself, if you think you're his enemy, you need to try harder because he doesn't think he has enemies. Yeah. Like he just perceives everybody as like a friend. And I wanted that. So I said, you know what? When I get out of the Marine Corps, I am going to legitimately pack up all my belongings and move to Virginia. Oh, uh, and you know what? I, I, I that brings I didn't mention that in the intro, and I was going to mention it here. But uh, Dave is also a combat veteran uh, Marine, and so uh, thank you for your service. Oh, man, I did it for greedy reasons. It got it got me out of a bad situation, and I suggest if anybody doesn't have direction in their life as a young person, military service is a good way to find discipline, give you some some tools for success, and. I would say even that. if you have a lot of direction, you know, my, our, our types of service were very different, but you know, I was a reservist who happened to get deployed. And, you know, I was deployed with chemists and, yeah, I mean, just some very intelligent people. And, and, I mean, they had plenty of direction in their life and, and just chose to, to serve. You know, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. And, and it's something that you can, you will take with you everywhere you go, like, like, and you don't even realize it because you're surrounded by so many people who have done it that when you when you get farther and farther removed as i get older the fewer vets i meet and like when i tell people or you know that comes up in conversation or whatever people are like you did that holy cow and i'm like well really it wasn't that big a deal i didn't really do a whole lot i played a lot of xbox and, <laughs> and there was a lot of downtime and 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 they're like yeah, but you were like in the military, and I'm like, well, yeah, it wasn't everybody, and it's like, well, no, like less than a percent are in the yeah. military, one percent of our population. Yeah, so, and then when you break that down even further, how many of that one percent are in uh, uh, a combat role? You know, there's a lot of support roles out there. Yeah, and yeah. everybody's important. Well, and, and to so, be very clear, my role was definitely support. I was, I was in, I was in Iraq, but I was definitely, you know, I'm a, I was a quartermaster, fuel supply. It's, so. It's everybody. I just don't want to be make it sound like I'm something oh. I wasn't. Oh man, you you didn't get like the hundred kill streak in Call of Duty. Oh no, it, yeah. Well, we didn't have Call of Duty then. We had Halo. Oh, I meant like Halo One. I, I was attributing that to the real life circumstances. Oh, People no. sometimes think that it's just like the video games, and you're going to go on these rampages, and then you're going to get you yeah. know the airdrop and all that other stuff. Yeah, that doesn't happen. I'll say, thankfully, <laughs> I didn't get. I didn't have to get that hundred kill. Yeah, streak. my bowels wouldn't be able to handle that. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, going back to the getting out of the service and moving here, it was huge for my development to say, I'm going to commit to this. And you would think at Purple Belt, you're pretty well established and committed. But the difference was I was a tough Purple Belt. I wasn't a technical Purple Belt. And when I tell people about that time in my life, I call it the will to win versus the skill to win era. Okay. Where... I just wanted it more and I would outwork people with bad moves. And you want to talk about getting a square peg, square peg in a round hole? 
I would make that happen. And there's a, my, one of my favorite dwarvish sayings is uh, pound the metal till it fits, doesn't work, bash to bits. That's funny. And you know, for the longest is time. Is that Tolkien? Is that from Tolkien? Uh, you know, it sounds like it, but it's really from Magic the Gathering. Oh, okay. It's on okay. the card Smash for all of you MTG players out there if you're looking for where that uh, flavor text came from. But <laughs> yeah, big nerd here. That was in the disclaimer. So meanwhile, I come here and now I'm seeing things for the first time ever that most people within our association would take for granted. Active toes, posture, hip placement, hand placement, you know, intelligent design questions. Like, I want to go to here. How would I do this efficiently without having attributes leading the way? And man, when I got here, fresh out of the military, I was 215 pounds. And then seven months later, I was 169 pounds by choice because I took my last MMA fight at a welterweight because that sounds smart when you're 215 pounds. And after that, I decided that I was going to hover around a more manageable walking weight of 185, 190. And I've stayed to that over the last half a decade. But losing the weight and the, the marine muscle led to me being a more efficient and tactical jiu-jitsu player. Yeah. And for people who don't know or maybe haven't heard of you or whatever, I mean, um, you, you have a DVD out there and I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not even doing this to like get more sales on it or anything, but, it, but it's, it's called, uh, mastering the Bravo or for, bringing back the Bravo. Yeah. Bring uh, it back. And, and, um, you know, it's, it's mostly Darsh setups, Darsh, Darsh jokes. So, like, like what got you into the Darsh joke? Like what, what you know, it's kind of an obscure move. Yeah. It, and it's maybe a little more enlightened these days, but but uh, you know for a long time it was just kind of this offshoot, hit it if you can type. Movie. Yeah, like a fallback on a failed arm and guillotine, yeah. or you know just something to do to maybe threaten uh, when someone's shooting an underhook from the bottom, and that's that's how a lot of people still see it. Yeah, and let's be honest, most people did it like as a neck crank, like it wasn't. Yeah, even, for they sure. Weren't even good at for it. sure, and I still see it to this day, and that's fine. Um, I'm not going to knock somebody if. They don't care about how they win because typically I don't care about how I win. But as an instructor, I want to make sure that I'm giving the move to the student in the way that I describe it. So if I'm going to call it a choke, we're going to do a choke. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question, it was really interesting. My first time ever meeting Mark Kukro, who trains at a Harrisburg, North Carolina Integrated Martial Arts, black belt under Master Sauer, uh, first degree black belt. He had been visiting this area at that time. I was a purple belt. He was a four stripe brown or something at the time. And he taught the class. Master Sauer is really keen on having his visiting instructors come in, share some cool details. And Mark was fielding some questions at the end of his instruction. And a guy here at the time asked a question on the Starsh choke. And I had seen it in classes, maybe once or twice before that. And I knew of it and I've seen it at tournaments, but I had never hit one in a competition and it just wasn't in my wheelhouse at the time. But I raised my hand, I knew how, how to do the move, so when the guy had the question about it, and Mark said, does anybody know how to do it? I raised my hand, I go forward, and then we start to think tank this process of what would Mark do about this? And not that I was gaming the game, but Mark had some legitimate concerns because of the way in which I did it, and it was a little off. And that's because of my lack of experience with the move. I only had a vague understanding of it. But to me, at that point, having trained here for a few months at that point, you know, we're still talking 2013. I had started January. Right. So this is May, five months of training here. And it was already that enlightening to me that I said, this is how the move should be done. Well, Master Shower happened to be walking by. He sees me doing the move with Mark and Mark's. Mark and I are kind of discussing it and, and breaking it down. And just from Master Sauer hearing this, he goes, man, you really got a, a handle on that. You should, you should keep going with that. And at the time, probably didn't know my name. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. You know, 300 plus students and I'm the new guy. I get that. But to get that compliment from him lit a fire under my butt. And I decided from that point forward, I was going to really commit to this move if I'm onto something. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to yeah, go ahead, gonna, please. I, I think there's an important thing to be said there. You and when I say you, I'm saying people in general don't always understand what impact they have when they say something, when they say it, like not receiving that compliment 
may have may may have meant that you would never have become Darth Vader. It may have been something you did at a seminar and then never again, right? Mm -hmm. But you received the right compliment from the right person at the right time, and boom! Next thing you know, you're winning tons of competitions with this thing, um, and and hitting it from just some of the most obscure. You and I rolled last night, and you hit it from some obscure angles, in my opinion. Um, uh, tricked me into it twice, and and almost three times, and 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 like, I, you know, it was like okay, you know, it's fun. It's fun to experience that. But I mean, I, I guess I wanted to break that up because I, I think that people sometimes just blabber and, and don't realize who they're talking to or what they're saying to people sometimes. And it's like, hey, have you have you tried approaching this in a different way? Because what you're saying makes a difference in that person's life. It's just it's just like jujitsu, right? I'm trying an arm bar on you and it's not working. So what does the average person do? They wrench on it and turn it and twist it and turn it. And it's like, if you stop to consider that that's not your arm you're twisting on, like if that breaks, you don't have to go home with the ramifications of it. How about do better next time and let go of it for now or, or you know, do whatever. But, you know, same thing, like the way you approach people and talk to people, I think is very important. And, and, and that's another thing that just master Sauer is amazing with. He, he's just, you know, he may know, have known very well just from 40 years on the mat, what, what he was doing at that moment. Like, you know, this, this guy looks pretty good at this move. I should probably tell him that. And, and that'll probably help guide his jujitsu. But yeah, anyway, and we, going back to your... But, you know, th this is a good point, and we should kind of spend some time here, because I am in a different capacity now than I was then. At that point, I was a student only. I am still a student, especially when Master Sauer's on the mat. We're all students of his. But I'm instructing. And I am cultivating that same confidence and sense of, sense of purpose in our student population here from from his side of view, or from his point of view you know i'm looking at them and i'm seeing a guy um like sam our blue belt who just recently had the uh the tournament last weekend and i'm looking at him and going man he's getting really good with this mechanic i better tell him that so i say sam you know in five years i'm going to be taking a seminar from you on this and it really you know it, it sparked something in him and he came back in this week Monday Tuesday and he's training hard and I wasn't here but I, I hear heard all about it and people are like man something happened with Sam and I know it was that because I felt that I lived that experience and now it's great that like you said we we, we as people need to understand that our words have meaning and I think yeah maybe it wasn't Thoreau but someone said you know a word after another word after another word is power mm-hmm yeah, and I'm, I'm reading a book right now called 12 Rules of Life. Uh, it's by Jordan B. Peterson. And, and uh, he, 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 you know, and some people hate the guy or, you know, whatever. Whatever you care about is politics. I really don't care. Do what you want. But but his books are very good. And, and uh, well, he talks a bit about that in there, about the power of encouragement versus discouragement. You know, it's, it's very encouraging for people to hear uh, that they're doing well. And if you want a reproducible behavior... It's very powerful to encourage the behavior and, and, and give, you know, accolades when the behavior is being done um, as opposed to just punishing and, and, you know, telling everybody when they do things wrong. And I mean, that's the difference between tearing someone up and, and you know, tearing someone down, picking them up. And uh, both can be very useful, but yeah. Uh, yeah, he talks a little bit about that in the book. Well... Master Sauer has a lot of little professorisms, right? And some of them are pretty endearing, especially when you think about the, uh, the language barrier mm -hmm. and how some things get lost in translation. So when he says stuff like, oh, you can't make an old horse drink water. <laughs> it's like, well, professor, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink and you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And he just kind of like pineapple pens it. Yeah. You know, it's okay. Um, but that's not the professors I'm talking about. I'm talking about those, those little nuggets of wisdom when he says stuff to the point of, you know, uh, it's only my move until you do it better. Yeah. And it's like, man, I can really get along with that. But more on to what we just said, you're born with two ears and one mouth, so you should listen twice as much as you speak. And what he really is meaning with that is, you know, you can pick up so much information just by absorbing, just by taking in and receiving. But if you're constantly opening your mouth and just telling everybody how it is, and the, how much are you really receptive to the world around you? 
And I love that because he has incredible awareness and he is living what he says. He embodies that principle as if he is like the avatar of, of reception. And you can sense it in his jujitsu because he, he really does let you dictate how you lose. He's taking in all your vibes, all your movements, and he just calculates and then he executes a program. And that's pretty much how it is. And that is not to say he's robotic, but man, does he just understand the game at that level. And it ends up making him this brilliant life coach too. Yeah, and, and you know, that I think, I love his jujitsu, obviously. Um, I'm, I will be Pedro Sauer for life, you, you know, it's just who I am. But uh, I think my favorite times with him are when we just go out to eat and, and just talk and listen to him and the way he interacts with people. And, and you know, it's very easy for high-level martial artists to pretend to be more than what they are and that, you know, in that we are all basically just a bunch of weirdos who wear, wear pajamas and, and colored belts. Mm -hmm. Like, that's literally what, you know, like, when you think about it, that's that's what I do. It's and true. To most of the population, we are weird. Oh, well, like, to most of the population, we're doing Taekwondo, but that's yeah. a different story. And, and it's strange, and, and it's like, why would you ever do that? And, and you know, or you tell them about, like, oh, yeah, you know, this guy had me in a choke, and it was on pretty tight, but I didn't want to tap because I thought I could get out. It hurt a little bit, and they'd be like, you're crazy. Why Why would you let someone do that to you? And it's like, well, I didn't. I got out. <laughs> you know, regular friends are like, how's the wife? How's the kids? How's the dog? Jiu-jitsu friends. How's the knee? How's the shoulder? How's the neck? Yeah. You know, we're weird. But. Yeah. So any, anyway, you know, he, he just, he, he has a way of approaching life that, that and people that is very, very empowering. And, and I think it's, it's important that people try to be that way. I mean, that's just, that's just my opinion. I, I, I try to emulate that as much as I can. Are we be all... happy for people's successes. Uh, you know, if, if they've done wrong, bolster them and, and say, hey, you know, I know you can do better than that. Let's, you know, I, I almost always try to give people the benefit of the doubt because I, I find it more, even just for my own sake, like, like I feel better when I just give people the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Oh, you think that guy tried to rip you off? No, he probably just made a mistake. Well, you know, but but what if he does it again? Well, I'm, I'm probably not going to put myself in that position again. But it, you know what I mean? Like, I'll just take it. I'll be like, it was on me. You, you know, he made a mistake. I won't put myself in the situation there again. And there we go. Now, now I don't have to And then you jujitsu it. You yeah. jujitsu the situation. Yeah. Well, you know, moving here was definitely one of the best decisions I made. And then in just a short period of time, learning the mechanics I did that cleaned up so much of what I had uh, initially struggled with. And then having him bolster me in that way with just that one little piece of advice. Man, you should really go with that. And then what most people don't realize is in four short years, I went from a guy who had a vague understanding of a mechanic to a guy who is sought after for his expertise on the mechanic. And so when he had said, and then you know a lot of his black belts like uh, Dexter Gould and so on would echo the sentiment, it's my move until you do it better. What do we do as jujitsu instructors if it's not teaching venomous snakes how to bite us? Mm -hmm. You know, they're giving us all this gold, and then we're trying to use it on them and use it on each other. And it's true, we have the capability of getting this knowledge and then applying it all the time. And it's up to us to decide how proficient we decide to be. If you see the move and you just put a ghost around it, as Master Sauer likes to say, and you never want to work it again, you're like, eh, it's not for me. Well. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always be where you've always been. That move is going to stay sucking forever. Yep. But if you put in the work, who knows where you can be? So we had this great conversation at dinner last night. We had it again this morning. But you're just going to, you're going to be as good with something as the work you put into it. And um, one of my favorite quotes of all time, Arthur Brisbane said, the dictionary is the only place in the world where success comes before work. <laughs> That's a great saying. And I've used it for 19 years now. Um, it, it's legitimately in my high school yearbook as my quote. You know what? On that topic, th this is something that, that uh, I, you are probably one of the most goal-oriented people I m I've ever met. Um, and, and for people who don't understand what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm going to give you a little <laughs> oh, understanding. You've only shown me a little bit once. But this man has a spreadsheet of like not not only like – moves he's quote working on but like how many he's done the date he did them 
you, you know, like you've you've hit almost a is it, is it over yet? A quarter million darts chokes. It's it's almost up to it. It's uh two hundred and twenty six thousand. Yeah, and, so, and and numbers. Now yeah. here's a, here's a question: Did the two that you hit on me the other day do those count toward that? Or it will. Or? Those are okay. live rolling repetitions, and okay. they don't have they don't have a greater value. Yeah, they just, and, they're just two that you've done. They're just two that I've done. Okay, um, but. Uh, in the last year and a half, Dennis Brogan, Secretary of Black Belt here under Master Sauer, who is one of my primary training partners and overall good dude and um, beer connoisseur. I just want to throw that out there because he knows more about it than I do and he's getting me on that. <laughs> but Dennis brought it to my attention and he said, anytime you do a move live, if it's a move you're working, it almost has like a permutation of like times 10 or not a permutation, sorry. Um, it's almost like at a at a multiplier of times yeah, like, 10. Yeah, like, like as opposed to working it on, on someone who's letting you do yes. it. Like, like a, compliant, a compliant repetition should have a base value of 1, and then a live rep should have a base value of 10 in his eyes. Now, I disagree in the sense that it should have a greater value like that, but I do feel like there should be a different section of the chart for this, for mm -hmm. this computation where as I'm figuring out like how many of these I've done, it is important to figure out, just you know, denote it not like with a MLB asterisk for steroid use, but right. like, hey, I did this under this circumstance. And it's not like it's even gloating. And I'm bringing this around to a point, specifically a question that somebody else asked. Please, it's not gloating to you know, you're not like, okay, Jim wins. Yeah, there's ten of them. I, as you always say, I won the open mat, right? Yeah, like, good job winning the drill. Yeah, nobody <laughs> cares. <laughs> you know, like that's not your point. Your point is that you've you've chosen to work a specific technique or, or many and and you, you have this chart with with you know and you've you've done triangles and arm bars and 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 because last year i think you told me you worked a lot on the arm bar and, arm bar and, yeah and uh you, you know you, you, my point is that you create these goals and and you set them and and you measure them and and as opposed to uh i would say the average person's method which you, you know certainly my method like Okay, yeah, I think I want to get better at Dars this year, and then you just do a bunch of Darses, right? And, and I don't really track it. I don't. I don't put it in an Excel spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And it's not that your methods necessary. I won't say that because I do think it is. But my method is certainly more average, right? That's what the average person does, and in my opinion, less goal oriented. But it's I like, think that's above average, to be honest. And, well, and in that you set a goal to begin with. Correct. But, yeah, but. You know, a question came up. I put it out there for, you know, hey, guys, I'm, I'm at this academy. If you have any questions or anything, let me know. And one guy, basically, his question had nothing to do with technique. It was about setting goals. And he said, you know, what's what's your method? Uh, and and he, he put it out there for anybody. But, you know, again, you being the probably the most goal-oriented person I know, uh, I think that you're the best person to answer this question. Like, what do you think is a, a really good method? or what is your method of setting a goal and then creating benchmarks and reaching that goal. So Okay. So we've all heard at some point or another the phrase, you know, peaks and valleys. We have high points in one aspect of our life and then at other points we have these incredible low points. And I've always looked at it from a, a building perspective of like a sand castle. Especially if you're talking about loose sand it's really, really hard to build up to a point because the sand just pours down the sides and you end up with a really wide base, but you don't get that really high peak. Mm -hmm. Really easy to fill in the hole though. Sure. And I've always looked at it from the perspective of, okay, well, if this thing does have some height to it, it's, it's good. Let me build it up from the bottom. Let me work my deficits. So for the longest time, it was get really good with my specialty. And this is a problem that you see a lot at white and blue belt. You get a little bit of success with one thing and then you only want to focus on that one thing to the exclusion of other things that should be getting worked and, on. And it, it's common to see this. Like you'll see someone who's like, oh, this guy's going to be the next black belt world champion. And then they finally get to the black belt level and they don't do that great because they have a move. Mm -hmm. And it turns out all black belts know that move. And Correct. unless you have a move built on top of another move on another one, then you don't win. Yeah. Anyway, coming, coming back. So if I notice there's there's a deficit somewhere, I and, and let me be very clear just because we're, we're saying specifics. Break it down. We have chokes, we have arm attacks, we have leg attacks. Um, let's say if I see 
And my personal proclivity is to attack the neck. And this just goes to an old school thing about, you know, not everybody has two arms, two legs, but everybody's got a neck. Mm -hmm. So I personally want that specific area to have the most in terms of my numbers, which it, which it does. But if I notice it starts to drop a little bit, maybe I'll focus more on my, my chokes for a while. But let's say leg attack starts to double in number over my arm attacks. Man, my arm attacks need to get higher. Okay, that's now my deficit. Now, what kind of arm attacks am I hitting adequately? Which are subpar? What are okay? What are good? And I'm going to go to the weakest one first. And I knew I noticed that I was doing a lot of shoulder locks and wrist locks, but I wasn't attacking the elbow. So my arm bars were not that great. So from 2005 to 2016, uh, I think I had four arm bars in competition ever. And then in 2017, when I had set the goal to do more arm bars in general, and all of 2016 was the workup for that, where mm -hmm. I did all the drills and all the reps. And now it's like, okay, now let's put it to the test. I hit uh, three times more arm bars in that one year than the subsequent 11 years combined. That was the goal. And I just made my arm bars skyrocket. And that was, that was empirical data showing me where I had a deficit, what I needed to work, and then my goal was set this. And I think I, I told myself I wasn't going to even try an armbar in competition until I had 2,000 reps on it from a given position. Okay. So now, how many positions can you do the armbar from? All of them. So how many <laughs> reps did I do? A lot. Yes. I did all the reps. So when people say, man, how, 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 many, how many reps does it take to get good at something? I was like, well, you know, sometimes I don't count the reps. I, or, or, that's not true. I count the reps. Sometimes the reps aren't the important aspect. It's the discovery of the perfect rep, right? And how do you get there? And this comes down to figuring out the difference on different body types, different skill levels, all the variants involved. And then you start to get into like the, uh, the why behind the why. How does this move work? Why does it work? And man, that's the real journey of jujitsu. If you can get those discoveries, those little eureka moments, then you have something that you can take with you everywhere. Man, because my arm bars got better, my knee bars got better. Mm -hmm. And I already had good knee bars. Because there's a fundamental understanding there that, that is, they're, they're similar. There are similar techniques. Correct. Uh, you know, I mean, the knee is just the elbow of the leg, right? So, Correct. So if you understand it to some degree, you can understand the other. Um, so, so what methods specifically do you, do you, you know, like I mentioned your Excel spreadsheet. So let, let's say my goal is, uh, let's say, let's take it out of jujitsu. Let's say my goal is to, I don't know, open a new business. Um, like how would you define your goal? And then what method do you prefer to use to track it? Uh, okay, so let's say, let's say my goal is to get to a certain number of students. Okay. Okay. Um, because, well, first and foremost, I'm not going to be wealthy doing jiu-jitsu, but if I have tons of students, I'm going to feel wealthy. Sure. Because I have a plethora of new people that are now my buddies. Yeah. <laughs> right? Get to hang out with your friends. Yeah, and it's great. That's one of the best benefits. It is to me, the best benefit, that social aspect. Um, set a realistic expectation of what you're potentially going to start with, which is yourself and maybe a good buddy who came in on with you. And you're okay. like, okay, so it's two of us. Where do I want to be after a week? Reasonably. You know, maybe it's just a feeler for it, which is I got a lot of phone calls made and I shook a lot of hands. By the end of the month, where do I want to be? By the end of two months, three months and so on and so forth. Now you can break it down into a personal, okay, today I need to talk to 12 new people. And by the end of the week, I need to at least have shown a contract to one person. By the end of the month, you, you do, you're adding up of all your weeks and days and everything together, and that should be your, your standard. And where, whatever you're hitting at that point is not going to be next month's goal. Next month's goal should be better than that. And you should be striving for better constantly. Because I, I, I read a quote by Dan Gable, uh -oh. um, and, and it, it said something, and I'm going to mess it up, but it was something to the effect of strive for excellence when you reach it, set a higher goal. 
because you should always be challenging yourself. Like it was like it was basically good enough never is. Like, Correct. Like just keep going. Correct. You know, I can constantly do better, which is why you know, even though I'll get guys like Bill Cooper, uh, Ryan Hall, Jeff Glover, who I look up to as you know mentors on the the Darce mechanic, guys who have really paved the way for me and my understanding, and. You know, having worked with Ryan a bit and uh, Glover on on two occasions, and Glover and I are actually pretty pretty cool in terms of like the open communication, and I talk to him whenever I can. And there was a Facebook Live going back to words having meaning, and you know what you say uh-huh. is important. You know, he was doing a Facebook Live one day, and he was with Pete the Greek, and they're just hanging out in the hotel room, just kind of you know hanging out and busting each other's chops. But I just chime in with. You know, whatever piece I had to say, just saying, what's up? And he goes, oh, man, the Darce master. What's going on, Dave Porter? And he might not realize it, but his following, the people that are looking to him, just heard the guy who I look up to as the Darce master calling me that. Yeah. And then I get a bunch of messages. Oh, man, I just saw the live feed. That's crazy. And I'm like, man, it had impact. Yeah. Immediate impact. And that's not to say that I'm better. It's just we recognize each other's skills and, and that was huge. Just having him say that. And I can't wait to work with him again specifically. Like we're going to work together uh, this summer, him, Bill Cooper, and I. I'm going to go out to Goodland and uh, train with them. and We're going to really think tank that mechanic further and talking about setting goals. It's still not better. I know that if the three of us get together, though, it will be. That's amazing. So let's go back to that business model. If, if my idea was to get to a certain number and after a few months I I start to see it dropping what do I need to breathe more life back into it maybe I read some books go to some seminars uh, meet up with some other people who are successful in my field and think tank it and see what they're doing Um, you can always augment an existing program and try to breathe more life into it and I think that's something that uh, not a lot of people seek guidance on that, that search for help great you have a desire to do something okay you can set out to do it but go in with as much knowledge as possible and when your knowledge is exhausted get more <laughs> and I don't think you can ever read enough on a given topic even if you're an yeah it's funny because uh, you know as a business person myself I read a lot of like marketing books economic books uh, sales books and a lot of it is repeat, but just said slightly different, you know, and, and sometimes the same exact subject shown by a slightly, by a different person mm-hmm. can have a completely different effect on you. You know, this is why people have their favorite teachers, right? Like, oh, I hated math teacher so-and-so in school, but I loved math teacher Smith. And it's like, well, weren't they both teaching you math? Well, yeah, but this person just got it. They knew how to get to me. And it's like, you know, they might have both been showing algebra, but you got it from one and you didn't get it from another. And and, and the knowledge itself might have been the same. You know, maybe maybe they have the exact same skill level, the exact same knowledge. And and meanwhile, maybe I liked the other person. Yeah. You, you know, and, and um, something else you said there that I, that I want to highlight that I think personally is very important for goal setting um, is masterminding. And, and like you, you're going to go out and train with 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 Bill and and with with uh, uh, help me Jeff out. Jeff thank you and, and uh, you know like you have to do that it be, it, you have to surround yourself at some point that, of course you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna need to apply these things mm-hmm. but at some point you have to to surround yourself with other people who are where you want to be and if you're quote the expert. You need to surround yourself with other people who are considered experts, right? Like, if I don't ever talk to other business owners, as a business owner myself, if I just assume I've got it all, I'm, I'm going to lose eventually because there's nowhere for me to grow. Or, or, and even if I don't, quote, lose, I'm not going to get better. You know, there's, but if I talk to people, you know, if, if my business is, is say, making, uh, you know, a, a half a million dollars a year and I want to be a business that makes a million, and I'm and I'm just talking to people who are making like twenty thousand. That's not going to grow me, right? That whereas if I talk to these people who are where I want to be or at least at my level or slightly above, I can now take some of the things they're doing and apply them. Having gone to school for dietary sciences, people don't understand 
how much that actually means. I was in like every kind of chemistry class, biology. I mean, it's a science field. Yeah. How does a scientific journal get published? It, it's hard. <laughs> it, it's very hard. And you know, you come up with an idea. You've formulated this idea based on some kind of factual information that you've established or that somebody else has established, and you either try to push it forward or challenge it. And then what do you do? You have peer review. You go out, you seek other people that are colleagues in your field or you know competitors in your field, and you put it to the test. And once everybody has said, man, that's legit, now you're getting published. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the important part of it, you know, and I'm not going to get into all the all the backwater stuff that can get all murky with like, certainly there's politics yeah like anti-vaxxers and you know what if yeah. you have your opinion as long as you feel like you're as educated and it's what you want you know you do you but for me i'm very much the empirical data guy and i've been that way since college and probably before that as a kid when i was cleaning up my room and i was very very uh ocd about it but man I like having that information and then using it to launch me into the next chapter, which could be, okay, now I can see where these deficits are. Let's increase my capacity here. Okay, now that hole is full. Is full. What's the next hole? What is the next lowest point in my game? I move that forward. If in the business side, it's like, man, you're, you're getting people in, but you're having problems keeping them there. Your retention is low. Now you got to fix a different aspect. What's the culture like in your academy? How is it that you're you're losing these people? Why are you losing them? Is it a price point thing? Is it uh, a growth in your students' uh, confidence? You know, figure that out. And I'm only using a jujitsu academy for this example, but you know, whatever your goal is, you set those expectations. You put in some numbers. You work off of your numbers. You keep pushing those numbers higher. And however however it is that you do that, you're going to find the low point fix that low point whatever you're doing right don't focus on that it's 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 that punch you don't see that knocks you out yeah and some people just hyper focus on the good and when you put up those huge blind spots that's where all the problems come in so i mean that's why i i train the way i do and i found a great level of success with it um to that point just using the numbers, uh, and actually I'll pull them up real quick because this is the easy sh easy spreadsheet. Just uh, a quick overview. And, and this is a tool you use. You, you, you use Excel spreadsheets a lot for your yeah, goals. Yeah, this is as updated as 10.39 a.m. two days ago. Okay. So this is recent. Um, and I have more on my on my iPad from, from last night that I still haven't put in yet on my, on my uh, shared drive. But, you know, 173 wins, 52 losses, one draw out of 226 total competition matches in just jiu-jitsu, right? That roughly translates to winning 76.54% of the time. So let's just make it easy numbers. You're hired, three, man. That's a hell of a record. Three, three quarters of the time, I win. A quarter of the time, I lose. Okay, I'll take that. That's, that's a C average, Yeah. right? Some people have a failing average at that. Very few people are so awesome that they are in combat sports that they're doing above that, right? Think about it from the perspective of the MLB. If you're batting uh, 225 or uh, batting 300. You're batting 300. You, you write your paycheck. Yeah. You're doing great. Yeah. And remember, that means you're hitting three out of 10 pitches. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at... At 70, 76%, I'm doing pretty good. But this is where the key is. Of those 173 wins, 165 are by submission. So now you break down the wins into, man, 95% of those wins are submissions. When you've only won by points four times out of 226 matches, your your goal was very much established. That's, that's the direction piece. And I wanna tell people, like you, when you have a goal, you then have to make it a specific goal. It's not just win, it's how you win. It's not just get numbers in your academy, it's what number. Mm -hmm. You have to be as critical on what that finish line looks like, or even if it's carrot on a string, like you said that unattainable, but you're striving for it, well, how big is that carrot, right? 
And I think people sometimes forget that. It, it's not just it, it's not just why or what, it's the how, how you get there. And then when you talk about the what, be specific with the what. Oh, I wanna have an academy. It's like, no, I wanna have a very good academy and high standings with great clients and everybody's doing awesome and succeeding and they feel like this is the best time of their life. Cool. Much harder to make happen, but you can do it. You know, it's funny um, that you mentioned that too because it, I, I I help a, a few businesses and, and, and anyway, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll talk to me and they'll be like, ah, oh, you know, I, I'm having this problem and, and almost all of them are like, I don't have enough students, right? That's that's what everybody's worry <laughs> is. And, and uh, it'll be like, well, what's your goal? You know, or how many do you have now? And they don't even know that. And it's like, well, how do you know you don't have enough then? Well, you know, well, okay, because you're looking at your bottom line and you're not making the money you're hoping to make. And, and so, well, then how many would be enough? Oh, I don't know, as many as I can. Okay, so if 300 students walk through your door today, would that be okay? Oh, that'd be amazing. Are you sure? Because if you ever had 300 people walk in a building at one time, I bet you couldn't even sign up one. You know, like, what's your actual goal? You know, I recommend, you know, for a business, figure out the monetary goal do the math, figure out how many students that equals, and then figure out how much it costs to, to market, how many students come in based on your marketing, and then do the math and right. put that kind of money into it. And, and it, you know, it, it's a very simple calculation that people really just mess up because they don't have the goal. They just say, as many as I can, or as many as possible. And that's really not true. And then capacity is a big thing that you just mentioned. You know, what if you don't have the capability to sustain whatever number you think you should do. Like if you don't have the capacity for it, you just can't do it. You know, um, realistic goals. So if I'm um, not the most agile human being in the world, probably all the flying submissions are not going to be my first thing I work, right? Maybe I'll build up to that ability to be agile enough to, to do them, but maybe I should start working like ground-based attacks for a while. And from a marketing perspective, if you're doing something and you're like, man, I've got uh, 2,200 square foot space. It's pretty substantial for like a starting space. But let's say I did like, you know, 2,000 square foot space, whatever it might be, some odd number. What could that reasonably sustain? Can I achieve that goal first? And then if I grow out of it, how long was my lease? What, what was I anticipating? How, how did I forecast this out? What was my goal for the next year, the next year, the next year? Did I plan this appropriately? Did I make all of these goals to where now at the end of that lease, I can go to a bigger space? Do I have the students and the capacity and the growth um, potential to make me reach that next goal? Yeah. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't run a school. I'm a student here that teaches as well, but having friends like you, having friends all across the association, seeing how people go about the, the business aspect, I can see the hard work, the dedication it takes. And man, one day that could be me, but that's gonna be after Master Sauer retires, because right now, like I said, I'm- <laughs> You have nowhere I, else to be. I, I am his biggest groupie. All right, so but, let, let's let's get off this. Yeah. We've been pretty heavy since, since the start. Avengers Infinity War, what did you think? Oh boy, here we go. All right, so, uh, you know, by the way, spoilers. If if I don't, yeah, do non, run away I don't now. do non-spoilers. Yeah, run away now. Find new friends. Um, let's see. We had this conversation yesterday, and I'll start with the the quick bit. Starting at point A, getting to point B. I don't care what direction you take. We obviously know straight line is the shortest distance between two points, but that would be boring. I love that in the comics there is terrible continuity issues in comics. Yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, keeping up with like Earth 616 and Earth this and Earth <laughs> that, and if you're not familiar with the comics, like there are these alternate realities and timelines all over the place. And then you have standalone books and graphic novels. Great, I dig all of it. Um, having said that, too many people that are purists of the comics want Infinity War to have led up and B, exactly as it was in the comics. Okay, that's unreasonable. Well, one, it can't be. The characters don't exist. 
Yeah. A lot of them are owned by Fox or, well, Sony, yeah. Sony Who, owned a Spider-Man. But. Whomever has the rights at this moment and so on and so forth. And yeah, we won't see the Silver Surfer in Infinity War. Which is really sad. It what a is. great character. Yeah, and you know, like, just a quick aside, I get compared to him more than any other comic book character at really? this academy. Just because of my style and the way that I flow, you know, I have a guy that calls me the Silver Surfer. And, yeah, but even with your beautiful locks? Eh, you know. Mm. <laughs> Anyhow... Um, yeah, so the starting point. Maybe the starting point was different. I'm a big point B guy. You know, I look at where we're going to end. How's it going to be later? So I get it. Not every, not every character was introduced the same way. A lot of guys got updates. Man, when Spider-Man was first introduced in the comics 70 years ago, it would not have been as relevant to do his introduction in that capacity with Robert Downey Jr., 12 years ago in the movies. I like that they gave him a, a newer uh, coat of paint. And a lot of these characters got that, right? Absolutely. Now, to that effect, people know the vision now in the, com in the movies, but I think he was a hard sell initially. If oh, you, if, the Avengers, imagine Guardians of the Galaxy. Nobody oh, yeah. knew who, the, even comic book fans really didn't know. Yeah, who and were. even still, the, the Guardians that they knew in the comics was like the uh, Star Fox and yeah, those it guys. wasn't even the same yeah, group as who we had. The, guys the we group have we have now is kind of an older group. They're the B team, believe yeah. it or not. So yeah, and, and you know they tried to get Star Fox in with Stakao, and you know uh, uh, Stallone played that character, yeah. and they made an allusion to that old group. They're, we're getting the gang back together at the end of Guardians Two. But anyway, going back to Infinity War, man, I get that. Every starting point for all those other characters was a little different, but man, we got here. Why can't we just enjoy it? Yeah. And the movie was kick-ass. You had a lot of... Um, uh, well, I mean, box office says that a lot of people enjoyed it, so... Well, I'm just talking about the purists that are going to be like, eh, with their nose in the air. I can't believe they didn't have this. It was in, like, the comics. Well, let's be honest. The visually stunning. Pacing was crazy. They had enough humor, but enough, like, really sincerely, like, oh, this is epically important battles and issues and, you know... Like the come to Jesus moments with certain characters. And oh yeah, it was great. And I thought they did a great job with uh, Thanos. They I, did. I thought they, and quite honestly, his motivations. My opinion is his motivations in the movie make more sense than they do in the comic. In the oh comic, yeah, for sure. It's kind of like I just want this chick named. Death. For anybody who doesn't know, he's trying death. To, literally trying to court death, which was what was alluded to at the end of the first Avengers movie, and and and. I think that's kind of like how they started and then they were like you know what let's make this a better character and, and well, they did a great job with him you know they, they've they mentioned on many occasions throughout the Guardians and other movies he is known as the Mad Titan yeah we see that he's big when you, he's standing next to the Hulk okay good we got the Titan bit let's focus on the Mad bit he's insane yeah he is insane um Anybody who's just going to say, you line up over there, you line up over there, and we split you down the middle, like on Gamora's planet when they showed him yeah. legitimately killing just one half. Yeah. That's, that's not the work of a logic, logical human being. It's a person like, who thinks he's being logical. Correct. This is a mad person. So, okay, check in the box. Name says it all. But more importantly, I don't, I don't necessarily care about that. We, we finally got to this point where we have the big bad why are we so worried about his motives? Why can't we just sit back and enjoy it? You know, I, th I think that we, our, our society likes a better bad guy these days. Uh, you, you know, we, we complain about the, the guy who just wants to rule the world. And it, like that, that's, I, I think we believe that bad guys are a lot more complex than that. And, and I think that's why we like it. I think that's why, I think that's why Michael Keaton's character of Vulture in, in Spider-Man did so well. Because... In some ways, people are like, oh, wait a minute, he, he kind of has a point. You, you know, like, this is a guy who was doing fine, was trying everything. You, you know what I mean? Like, like there's, a, it, there's he, he might be not wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know? So I, I think that's, that's an and, important And, you thing. know, Eric Killmonger and Black Panther got a lot of, um, got a lot of attention because people are like, man, he might be radicalized, but he did have a strong point. And that polarizing point of view does make you a bad guy though you, 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 you're Absolutely. an extremist you yep. are an extremist and so to that point you know 
man, there are a lot of people that are like, I kind of get Thanos. They're like, I get him. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of crap out there, and not everybody can be fighting for the same resources. Yep. And to that effect, yes, the Infinity Gauntlets, if he snapped his fingers, he can double the resources. Instead of having the populations, sure, we can go the other route. But he's insane. But he's called the Mad Titan. He's not called, you know, the benevolent caregiver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, let's, if, if Thanos had that name, we'd have Here, a different have movie. have more of everything. Yeah. And you get it. And you get it. It's like Oprah Winfrey did not get the Infinity Stones. Oh, that would have been a great scene. Yeah, just give it? everybody more. Him just and like you get this. Click in and you, and get, you get a house and you get some potatoes and you get yeah. some... Yeah. No. It, it makes Why way... potatoes could pop into my head? Hey, man. Why is that what popped in? You know, we all have our starch. We, we all have our starch of choice. <laughs> but, you know, Infinity War did a bang-up job with the character development. And, you know, <laughs> let's just talk about yeah. the forecast. What happens in the next movie? Because if you don't know, well, once again, we've already given spoilers, more than half of what was the Avengers assembled, you know, greater team was gone. Now, half of all the universe's life is gone, but more than half of the Avengers are perished. So if you yeah, just did gone. a head count, and, and I hate to say this, but, you know, some characters, just what the hell were they going to do anyway against Thanos? You had a, 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 basically a few guys in super suits, and that's it. Like, Black Panther, box office success in his movie. And people are already complaining because they killed him off in this. But what he's, would that guy do? He's come back. That, that's, the, that, the, that's the issue I had. I and mean, I, I mentioned it briefly yesterday, specifically with Spider-Man and Black Panther. Yeah. Is because I know timelines. they already have the movie timeline out, and those two are... So they're going to have some way of bringing them back. I would rather even have that, that mystery of, like, Oh, or what it, will happen? Maybe Sony bought back their or took back their rights. You know, or, and I know, think whatever. at this point, at this point, with the interwebs and with people's inability to just kind of relax and wait for the information to come to them, they will go out and seek the information. Especially on like, you know, did anybody seriously not know how Harry Potter Seven B, like Part Two, yeah. is going to end? Did yeah. anybody wait for the end of Twilight? Like people found these things out. So at this point. The people that want to know are just going to do a quick Wikipedia search and be like, how does it end? Yeah. So as these guys are looking for their, for their ends to Infinity War, they know that these guys are coming back. I don't necessarily think there's a fault with all of these uh, movie companies to get the production going and just keep the ball rolling with, what are, what are they on, Generation 4 soon? Or oh, yeah. Phase 4, rather? Yeah, I think Phase 4. So, I know Infinity War is the end of Phase 3, and now you're going to be looking at like Captain Marvel. You're going to be looking at the Ant-Man Wasp follow, uh, follow up to Ant-Man you're gonna, with, which you know you and I had discussed Ant-Man yeah. but you know you're going to look at all these follow up movies you know Black Panther this uh, part 2 and 3 um, a lot of new characters being developed for that phase 4 shift but just going back to Infinity War honestly what was Black Panther going to do to Thanos nothing nothing Captain was, America was going to do nothing what was well Captain America still there yeah. true but but what was, and I know they're comparable, they're super yeah. soldiers for the most part, but what was Spider-Man going to do? What did he do? Nothing. You know? He and, tried to pull the glove off. Yeah. And to that end, you know. And uh, out of all of them, after Hulk, Spider-Man's definitely the strongest. Well, maybe Vision. Thor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Forgot and now that. that Thor is kind of like uh, Xbox achievement unlocked, you are now true as Guardian. Like, yeah, well, man, I'm glad they brought him back and made yeah. him tough again because they could kind of depowered him. A they bit. did, especially in like Thor two and then the Avengers uh, one and Age of Ultron. He just didn't have that Thorness to him, mm -hmm. and I think making him go the route of Ultimate Thor. If you're not familiar with the comics, there's Marvel Ultimates. Um, his armor alluded to it with those six glowing patches on his chest. Mm -hmm. The hammer is now Stormbreaker which was not Mjolnir, the original hammer. They went the route of Thor Ultimate, which is not only Marvel making the nod to, hey guys, we're not following this per that storyline. We're kind of making other storylines intersect, which is why in Infinity War you saw the Iron Spider suit for Iron uh, for, for Spider-Man, which was initially introduced in Marvel Civil War. You know, they're doing things out of... Do you, do you feel they, they, missed, they missed an opportunity there? With Iron of, Spider? Of creating Venom? No, I don't. And here's why. The storylines are, are out of sync with timelines, and Venom should have been introduced later. Yeah. Like, as an because, older because, Peter Parker. Because Peter Parker's an adult when that happens. Yes. 
and I, I just feel like, man, he went to a, this other planet. That would have been a great opportunity. You know, maybe yeah. the Iron Spider suit gets destroyed. Yeah. He but finds then, you know, you, you muddle it and you have too many yeah. cooks in the kitchen. And, yeah, probably. And, and, but, I mean, even like, it does, you don't even have to know it's Venom. He just comes out with a black suit. Oh, know? yeah, that would be tough. Like, or, or, or even like Tony Stark says, oh, man, your suit is wrecked and, and just uses what he finds on the planet. And, you know, and it turns out that it's... And, and I don't want to overdo it with too many nerd references, but anybody who was big into Magic the Gathering knew that there was this... Uh, this overarching bad guy concept of this this guy Yogmoth and it's basically like black caustic tar everywhere and then like one of the heroes of the story this guy Karn who's like a uh, an automaton that ends up getting a, a spark of life okay he gets corrupted by this shit and it and it forced like 10 more years it forced 10 more years of playing style for the card game yeah. you guys talking about magic we're on the podcast you're on the podcast now <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. So, We're almost done. So when you have stuff like that, it's like, man, you, you've like corrupted the good. And they have that in Spider-Man, you know? And you can go into the psychology of Carl Jung and um, Joseph Campbell. Jo by the way, good book for anybody listening. If you want to hear about the archetypal creation of heroes in general, there is a book by Joseph Campbell, um, deceased since the 90s, but um, a mythologian of world renown. And the book is called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. And he basically boils it down. It doesn't matter if it's Hercules or Luke Skywalker. And he references both. They have the identical story path. Jesus yeah. Christ, whoever it can be, you talk about anybody who has persevered, overcome, and became a champion of whatever cause. They have a very similar story. And is it because we have to have that to be a hero? Or is it just this intrinsic thing in our hive mind nature that we think these people are doing the, or that's what it takes and great book for anybody out there we'll have to check it out unfortunately we're running out of time cool the studio is being overrun yeah um, our, our studio for anybody who doesn't know is literally like a, just a couple chairs in the middle of the the floor so we're actually the ones who are kind of in the way at this yeah point. at the headquarters there's a lot of things going on right now but, but uh, you infinity know. war go see it um you're not going to be disappointed a lot of cast will be back yeah ed fell asleep in it Ed, yeah. you're, if you're listening right now, we we have words. Okay. So anyway, David, I really appreciate having you on the, the podcast. It, it, it's been a fun. It's been awesome. I hope we have to do it again sometime. Um, but, uh, you, you know, how, how can people get a hold of you if they want to contact you? Where can they find your your My your number's gear? listed fools. Where, no, um, you know, I, I, I'm not too cool for school. If anybody messages me through social media it doesn't matter which outlet you find me on either dave Dars on instagram my my full name david porter on facebook i will always talk to you i'm not i'm not unapproachable in person either just find me i'm a dude okay and we'll we'll discuss anything you want from comics to jujitsu to you know beer all right and uh for anybody who, who's never been to the uh the Herndon Academy here. If you if you're listening, it's a seven zero three four 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 six eight. You can call that number and and they'll uh, they'll answer for you. You just play that back if you want to. Um, and uh, you know, I highly recommend you try out jujitsu if you haven't. It's it's probably the best thing you could do for your life. And then uh, you know, if you want to get a hold of me, of course, uh, you can go uh, black belt tips or I'm sorry, yeah, black belt tips at gmail dot com. And uh, I'm at top level gjj on Twitter, although I very rarely look at it. Um, so. That, that email is probably the best way to get a hold of us. Uh, and, of course, Black Belt Tips on Facebook. So, listen, guys, I really appreciate you, uh, you listening in. Uh, don't forget to share and subscribe and like and anything else that I'm supposed to say with that outro because it's normally Ed's thing. Uh, you, you know, you go ahead and, and do those things. And, uh, David, thanks again for being on. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm Bill, and we are out.